you shouldn't be nervous, Don. You always do a good job. And you did correct yourself and got it right. There aren't page, page numbers in the songbook. There are songs number, and you, and you got, it, got that right. So you got everything right, and you, you always do a good job. Amen, amen, and amen. One thing I didn't get right, invitation song 902. You got that right, too. 902, the invitation song, hymn number 902. Yeah, not page number. It's a hymn number 902. If we can get them to believe there, there are no chapters in Psalms, and if it's the book of Revelation, then we got it made in the shade. As I said this morning and tonight, we're going to take a look at just a couple of the passages that use faith, hope, and love. And next Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll look at some more that use faith, hope, and love. And then after that, another Sunday, Lord willing, of faith, hope, and love. Isn't that awesome? All the faith, hope, and love coming up. As I was looking at those passages, I noticed that there are a number of other words that occur along with them. And tonight, we're going to look at just a couple of passages where faith, hope, and love occur with uh, the words mercy, grace, and peace. And so uh, those are combined together. Uh, you know that the New Testament is not complicated, but it's just so amazing. It's just incredible. The, the, the more you look, the more you see, and you never get to the point where you say, well, I've got enough of that. I think I'll just not pay attention to it anymore. Every time you look at it, you find more, and it just gets better and better. And so, again, it's not complicated. It just is incredible. It's just amazing. And it's amazing as we look at faith, hope, and love and see how they interact with mercy, grace, and peace. The first of the two passages we want to take a look at is in Romans chapter 5. And we'll look at a few other passages as we go along, but not, not very many. We'll be pretty much in these two passages. We quite often begin with verse 6 when we're looking at chapter 5. And it's that incredible passage that talks about while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But if you just back up to the five verses that precede that and that start the chapter, uh, there are some incredible things contained in that passage also. From verse 1 of Romans 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, been, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope in the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that the tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. There in verse 1, it tells us that we are justified by faith. And there's that word faith already. Do you know what justified means? It's just as if I had not sinned, but... If you, like in, in my Bible, I don't know if it's in yours, both, both sides are straight up and down. The text is straight up and down both sides. And that's justified text. When the text is justified, it comes out just a, a straight line on both sides. It's all been lined up the way it should be. And that's what happens to us as, as Christians is we get straightened out. We get put in a straight line and we get justified. And it is by our faith that we are justified. Notice that it says that being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And that's going to be one of the common words we're going to see tonight, especially in the second passage we're going to look at. But it gives us peace with God. You know, we were at war with God. We were at odds with God. Isaiah 59 tells us that, that our sins have made a separation between us and God. You can go back to clear to the Garden of Eden and God created us in a covenant relationship with him. Adam and Eve had a, walked with him in the garden, but the sin ruined it. And it is through our faith, being justified by faith, that we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's another thing that's common wherever you go because nothing important happens without Jesus being part of the equation. And as we go through these passages about faith, hope, and love, Notice how often it's connected to Jesus and especially his death, burial, and resurrection. And so being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we also have an introduction by faith. We are justified by faith and we are introduced by faith into this grace, this grace in which we stand 
And a little later on, we'll be looking at uh, what we walk in and what we live in, what we don't walk in and we don't live in. But we stand in, in the grace of God, and that's where we stand. And we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And so there's that word hope, grace and hope in that one passage. And so we have our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. And as a result, we exalt in hope of the glory of God. But then there's this process. This process, it may not be quite so attractive to us because it starts out with tribulations. You rare, very rarely get something of great value without putting some effort into it. And that's true of spiritual things. And the, the road toward the kind of hope that we're talking about begins with tribulations because overcoming tribulations gives us the strength that we need. And so from, from tribulations, through tribulations, and by overcoming those things, it gives us perseverance. We learn perseverance by dealing with our tribulations. And the perseverance then gives us proven character. And it is the proven character that gives us hope. Remember we said that the hope we're going to be talking about is not a hope like, oh, I hope so-and-so wins the Super Bowl now that the Chiefs aren't playing. I don't even know who's in the Super Bowl now that the Chiefs aren't playing. But, see, we don't care. And it doesn't matter. But... It's not that kind of hope we're talking about. What we're talking about is a done deal. But what, one of the things that makes it a done deal is what we've been through to get us to where we are. And over and over, by going through tribulations, developing a perseverance and proven character, that builds up our hope. And it's even more of a sure thing because of what God, God does through us. And this kind of hope, the kind of hope that develops from our tribulations, is the hope that doesn't disappoint. It's not counting on one particular team to win the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever. It is a kind of hope that has no disappointment attached to it. And here's the love part. Because the love of God has been poured out. And as we look at the love of God, we understand that whatever love we have is because he first loved us. We did not start the thing God did. And if you'll go over to 1 John chapter 4 for just a second, one of the times we'll skip over. You have to love 1 John chapter 4. First John is one of the 27 great books of the New Testament. It is, it is right up there. It's one of the greatest 27 books. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In verse 18, he says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Whenever we talk about our love, and it's important that we have love, we need to understand that it's just a reflection. It's just reflecting the love of God that he has had for us, and whatever love we have for others is a reflection of what God, the love that God has had for us. And so the hope that we're talking about doesn't disappoint. It's because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. It is within us, and God has put that in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and it is a gift. We did not earn it. We did not deserve it. It was given to us. And so Romans 5, 1 through 5, talks about faith, hope, and love in combination with grace and peace. We're justified by faith and have peace with God. Justify by faith, have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have an introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. We exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And then there's that process that starts with tribulations. It leads to perseverance, which leads to proven character, which leads to the kind of hope that does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Isn't that an amazing passage? You might want to go back and read that sometime. And the other amazing passage we're going to look at tonight is Ephesians chapter 2. And if you can count, that's the whole chapter. Because there are 22 verses in this chapter. The first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too also formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, 
and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. He begins by saying, you were dead. That's one of the hardest things to convince people of. That may be one of the biggest obstacles to sharing the gospel with them, is they don't know they're dead. You can kind of, it's hard to get somebody to go to the doctor when they don't realize they're sick, and it's really hard to get them to go to the doctor if they don't know they're dead. And so, spiritually, we need to understand that we're not just sick, we're dead. Without Jesus, we're dead. And if we can just convince people that outside of Christ, they're dead, that would go a long way, I think, toward convincing them that they need to do something about it. It is our trespasses and our sins that cause us to be dead. And as I said in Isaiah 59, it says that our sins have made a separation between us and our God. And if we're separated from God, we're dead. Because life is only in God, and if we're separated from him, then we're dead, and our trespasses and sins have made us dead. And it says you formerly walked in them. And we've from time to time pointed out just a whole series of passages going through the New Testament that point out that Christians didn't start out perfect. They don't even end up perfect, but they didn't start out that way. And passages that list various sins, and then Paul says something like, in them you once also walked. Uh, one example of that is Titus chapter 3. It's just one of several passages. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, in whom he, poured, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so, there are a lot of people out there who are guilty of a lot of these things, and they included a lot of us, didn't they? It doesn't mean that we've always been the kind of people that we are today and I hope that tomorrow we're not the same person we are today I hope we're better tomorrow than we are today and today better than we were yesterday but when we see people living in these conditions we need to understand that's where people start out but they can change they can be changed uh, by the blood of Jesus but it's no surprise to say that for Paul to say you formerly walked in these sins and there are other just lists of sins that we would say well those are really bad sins and Christians used to walk in those, but they have been changed. They don't do that anymore. He said you formerly walked in them, and that's how you formerly lived. You lived in the lust of your flesh and indulging the desires of your flesh and mind. And that makes us think of James chapter 1 that gives the relationship between temptation and lust and sin and how that all works in our, our lives. But Paul says that you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You, you walked in them. You you lived in the lust of your flesh and indulging the desires of your flesh. Two of the greatest words in the Bible. But God. Without those words, it would be kind of hopeless. You were in this situation, you were dead, but God. God who is rich in mercy and great in that love even while we were dead in our trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. We have been saved by grace. And I guess, guess I should have read verses 4 through 7 because that's where these are. He says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out, I'm back in Titus, it, looked really, it sounded really familiar to me in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. But God, who is rich in mercy and great in love, 
while we were yet sinners, while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We are saved by grace. You remember that grace is the gift side of it, and by grace we get what we don't deserve. By mercy, we don't get what we do deserve. But by God's grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. And we don't deserve doing, getting what God gives us here. He made us alive together with Christ, and he raised us up with him. Here again, there's the association with the death, burial, and resurrection with all of these wonderful things. Not only that, but he seated us with him in the heavenly places. And sometimes in the heavenly places in Ephesians refers to the church. And so this is not just something we're, thrones we're going to sit on uh, when we get to heaven. Uh, we, also, we already have uh, wonderful places in the kingdom, don't we, in the church? Uh, we all have wonderful seats in the kingdom. And he has seated us with him in the heavenly places in order that in the ages to come. Now we've pointed out that we are in the last age. That there's no other age. But here he's not talking about that. He's talking about in future years. In the years to come, he can show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We were dead, we were lost, but God raised us up with Jesus, seated us with him in the heavenly places, so that in the ages to come, he can show the, the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Going on from verse 8 down through verse 10, of Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that, one, that no one should boast. For we are his, work, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And here again there's, a, there's that faith, and there's that gift, and by the gift of God we have been saved through our faith, we didn't do anything to deserve this. We didn't deserve Jesus coming to earth to die for us. Uh, God did not wait until we deserved Jesus. Or Jesus would have never come. And so it's not because of what we do we've done. It is a free gift of God. It is the gift of God, not because we've done anything. And even after that, it's not because of works. We don't earn Jesus coming, and we don't earn our salvation. If we did, we might be able to boast of something, say, look what I did. I'm a, I'm a good person. Look at how good I am. I've earned my salvation. But that just doesn't, it doesn't work because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of that sin is death. And so if we go on our own merits, we're in a world of hurt. But it's not a result of works that anyone should boast because we are the workmanship of, of God. If you've ever looked at any great works of art, any great sculptures, any great paintings, any works of architecture, and think, whoa, that's really incredible. That's nothing in compared to what God has done with us. We are his workmanship. He has created us and made us in Christ Jesus for good works. Why do we do good works? To earn our salvation? We're going to come up short if, if that's how we do it. We do good works because that's what God created us to do. That's what Christians do. And that's how we reflect his love is by going out and helping other people and doing good works. We are his workmanship created for good works. You know, God has already prepared those works for us to do. We just have to find them and do them. Uh, it doesn't take that much on our part. Just open our eyes and when the door opens, just walk on through it. God has already done the hard work. Just see what he has prepared for us and be ready to do those things that we should walk in those things. We walk in those works because that's what God has prepared us to do. And then in verses 11 and 12 of Ephesians 2, it says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Remember, therefore, that you were Gentiles. And in fact, in the sense of being not God's people, everybody was a Gentile. Even the Jews were Gentiles because they weren't God's people either. But today, those of us who really are physically Gentiles need to be 
reminded that there was a time when Gentiles had no relationship with God. At that time, in the time of the old law, they were separate from God. They were separate from Christ. They were separate from the Messiah. And they were excluded from being God's people, from being part of Israel. And God had that covenant, that covenant of promise. And God made that promise before Moses. He made the promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to bless all nations through his seed. But we were strangers to that covenant of promise. And here's that hope, but in a negative sense, because when we were in that condition, there was no hope. We had no hope because we were without God in the world. Do you know what distinguishes heaven from hell? Heaven is where God is and hell is where God is not. And that is the worst, best and worst thing about heaven. The best thing about heaven, and we don't, we don't know a lot about what it's like, but we do know that's where God is. They couldn't get any better than that. And the Bible tries to use things we can understand to describe hell, but it really cannot describe hell sufficiently. We don't have the vocabulary or the understanding, but that is where God is not, and there's nothing worse than that. But there was a time when we were without hope and without God in the world. Do you know how many people there are out that door who are in the same situation? Who are without hope and without God in the world. But, verses 13 through 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. This was the situation. The Gentiles were excluded from everything good. They were without God in this world. But now in Jesus, everybody has been brought near by the blood of Jesus, because Jesus is our peace. Remember I said earlier, there's nothing that happens here that doesn't involve Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection because he is the, the focus of all of this. And he took Jews and Gentiles and made them both into one group. We are the children of God. We are Christians. He broke down the barrier or the dividing wall. And that dividing wall went both directions. It divided us from God and it divided us from each other. You had Gentiles and Jews with a wall here and they had both of those with a wall here between them and God. And Jesus broke down those walls and eliminated those walls. And he broke down that barrier, the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. And by doing that, broke down the barrier wall with Jesus. He abolished in his flesh the enmity that was contained in the old law. And he made both of us into one new man. And then beginning in verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. He preached peace. He came and preached peace to those who are far. He preached peace to those who are near. He came and preached peace to everybody, far and near, that all of us have access in one Spirit to the Father. And that's how we get to the Father is through the Spirit. We're not strangers and aliens anymore. You don't have God's people and then us. Uh, we're all God's people uh, through the blood of Jesus. We are fellow citizens with all of the saints. In fact, we are saints. If we're fellow citizens with the saints, I guess that makes us part of that group. We are saints. And Jesus preached peace. He preached peace to God's household, and that's us. And that household is founded on the apostles and prophets. Now, the real foundation, as we know, is Jesus. But it was laid by the apostles and the prophets, those who prepared the way for it. But Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the main stone. He's the, the stone that holds it all together. And it's in Jesus that the whole building is built up. 
is fitted together. It grows into a holy temple to the Lord. We are also being built together into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. You know where God dwells? Right in here. God is dwelling in, in us. And we have been built into the temple of God. And that's who we are. And it's all because of the peace we have through the blood of Jesus. Those are two passages that use faith, hope, and love, but also bring in mercy and grace and peace to paint a, a beautiful picture. If you have a pencil and a paper, a pen and paper, don't write down Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. I repeat, don't write down Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. And don't be ready for next week's sermon on those two passages. If you missed those, I have them written down up here so you can take a look. As I said, all of this hinges on the death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we always, always offer the opportunity to obey the gospel. To have an opportunity to put Jesus on in baptism, to be buried with him in baptism. To leave our old person behind, whatever it was that we were doing before. Come up out of the waters of, of baptism and be an entirely new person and start a new life. Leave that old walk behind us and start a whole new walk. And that's why we always make that invitation. And it's not limited to Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Uh, anytime, if someone feels that they are prepared, that they know what, what's, uh, what the Bible says and that they need to be baptized, it doesn't depend on, on our schedule, our worship schedule. And so if anybody ever wants to talk about that, study about that, uh, act on that, we're always available. And as we always mention, that is just the beginning of our Christian walk. And being human, as we go along, we often stumble. We often uh, make mistakes. We go through those tribulations and we don't always have the right outcome. But we're here together. It's a, it's a group thing. And we're here to help each other and to encourage one another and pray for one another and study with one another. And that's something that, it's, it's not a burden, it's not a problem for us to do that. That is a joy to sit down with somebody and come alongside them and encourage them. And so if there's any way that we can help you, uh, please come as we stand and as we sing. <laughs>